Jason, Michael and I were in uh, Bangladesh and we realized that this was the perfect allegory for talking about climate change, right? Because yeah. you have this this point, which all which was the deadliest storm in history. We have the response of building a wall by India and you have the 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 Indian politicians saying, look, it's going to happen again at any time. And you know that in, when we start, we'll start talking about the vortex here in a second, that as this um, kicked forward in 1970, it almost led to nuclear war between the USA and USSR. So these like small little conflagration points are actually uh, sites of, of international conflict. Yeah. Scott Kearney is an investigative journalist who has worked for publications like Wired, Mother Jones, Playboy, and NPR, and is the author of several books, including What Doesn't Kill You, The Wedge, The Enlightenment Trap, and his most recent book, The Vortex, about the Bola cyclone and the aftermath in Bangladesh. He's traveled all around the world and has had a crazy interesting background, uh, becoming something of an expert in body hacking, especially cold plunges and the, the Wim Hof method. In fact, he was the first person to interview Wim Hof when he worked for Playboy back in the day. Um, he sent me his book, The Vortex, and it, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, there was so much in that story, which all just started with, the, it just started with the deadliest storm of all time. It started with that. What came after that was a genocide, a war for independence, and a nuclear standoff that came about as close to nuclear annihilation as we have ever seen. None of this I knew about before I read this book. So yeah, the whole, the whole thing blew me away. So I wanted to talk to him and hear more about his travels through that part of the world and have him share more of his experiences with me. Super interesting guy. I really enjoyed talking to him. But for now, I will stop introducing him and get into my conversation with Scott Carney. So how many how many books have you written and, and like uh, what's the progression? How'd you get started and all that kind of stuff? So uh, started off as an anthropologist who dropped out of grad school at the dissertation. I like, got to the dissertation like, oh my god, I can't write for like five people. I have to write for more than five people. And uh, oh, and then I and then I moved to India because my field site was in India. And uh, the first book was about organ trafficking because a village next door to where I lived, everyone sold their kidneys. And you know, I, I was there. I was writing for Wired or and for you know various other magazines, newspapers, and. Uh, you know, eventually we had National Geographic come out and we lined up 60 women and they, you know, everyone had their nephrectomy scar oh on God. them. And it turns out that, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's sort of a recipe for organ trafficking. You, you have like a, a refugee settlement or just like a lot of, very, of poverty next to world class hospitals and presto, um, you get organ trafficking. So hmm. I spent six years investigating that, looking at buying and selling human skeletons, hair, um, uh, eggs and surrogate pregnancies and all this stuff. And so I was like a very serious, hardcore journalist in the beginning of my career, you know, do, doing war zone stuff, doing, wow. um, you know, all, all the, the things that are super macho in the journalism world. <laughs> so I, so I, I standing did in a hurricane with a microphone and a yellow parka. And... <laughs> that I didn't do. I never did like on the spot TV stuff, but yes, like it was, it was like, you know, you know, interviewing mob bosses and getting murderers on tape, you know, me going in and I, and I speak Hindi. So I'm like very good at India. Like I okay. can really travel. I was in there for six years. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I, uh, there was this incident where, um, oh man, um, where I was uh, leading a meditation retreat in, in India, uh, not leading. I was like leading a broad program to a meditation retreat and a monk taught the meditation retreat. And one of my students, um, this is in the, the birth place of where Buddha found enlightenment, um, Bodh Gaya. One of my students, after seven days of meditation, jumped off the roof of the retreat center and committed suicide. Oh my God. Uh, and I was responsible for bringing her body back home and, the, um, and, and also figuring out what happened. And I read her journal as part of this investigation. And the last words were, I am a Bodhisattva, which is essentially a Tibetan Buddhist angel. Uh, and she, she, she thought she was enlightened and all she had to do was leave her body to mm -hmm. attain moksha is sort of the, the the next stage and this sent me on this like you know a incredibly traumatic probably the pivotal moment in my life because it's like how does something so beautiful as spirituality turn so negative and so horrible and i uh i spent years collecting journals of other people who died on meditation retreats and i ended up writing a book called the enlightenment trap which comes out again on january 15th <laughs> um uh about sort of intensive meditation and psychosis uh, and spiritual bypassing. And it focuses on this group of people who died meditating in Arizona. So I sort of like start with Emily's story and then look at this cult in Arizona. 
Um, and then, so after being like, you know, intensive organ trafficking guy to um, anti-cult guy, charlatan guru guy, I then see this photograph of a dude on an iceberg meditating. His name is Wim Hof. This is in 2011. I see the photo and I'm like, that looks weird. He's going to get people killed. And I, <laughs> and I fly up to Poland to write about him for, for Playboy. And instead of debunking him, I ended up doing the same stuff he does. So I went to this point where I was like, superpowers are impossible to here I am like on the top of a mountain in my bathing suit, steam coming off of me and uh, I can do this stuff too. And so that like led this like 10 year journey with the Wim Hof method on um, this guy was named Wim Hof. And, uh, and it was, that book was a New York Times bestseller. And it, I went from like, meditation will kill you to like, mm, sometimes it's really good for you. <laughs> and that's been like, that spawned two different books of like, um, biohacking, sort of investigating the, the physiology and how your body changes with the environment. So that is my career, almost in a nutshell, except I was hanging out with my friend, Jason Michelin, who was a friend of mine in grad school. And we were reading a Wikipedia article on like <laughs> the deadliest storms in history. And we're like, oh, look, it was in Bangladesh. And like, For, we for my listeners, that. that's what nerds do. They hang out and read <laughs> Wikipedia articles. Just in case you're wondering. Okay. Like my, um, like my, I, like my audience isn't a bunch of nerds themselves, but they're totally, you guys are all yeah. nerds and you yeah, know okay. it. That's uh, good. We, we like it. Um, but yeah, but we were, we were looking and I, I lived like where I lived in India was in Chennai, South India. And so I was like right next to Bangladesh the whole time. And I knew, I know India really, really well. Like India is a place I know. And I like, I knew nothing about that war mm. and about this storm. And so Jason and I, who's my co-author on this book, the vortex, uh, went to Bangladesh and found and, you know, uh, for a magazine called Foreign Policy. And we we wrote about this wall that India had built around the entire border of, of Bangladesh. And Bangladesh only borders two countries. It's India and uh, Myanmar. Uh, and they built this wall, just like we have on our southern border here in the United States. And like, we're like, why are they building this wall? And they just killed like a 13 year old girl or corpse laid on the fence for a few days. And everyone was very angry about this because naturally that's a really bad thing. Yeah. And I was interviewing the family and all this stuff. And, uh, and but it turns out like when we start talking to people, it's like it all traces back to this storm because it, during this storm, which is 1970 Pola cyclone, uh, millions of people uh, crossed over the border into India, destabilized the region, and then it, it you know, set off this tit for tat stuff that ultimately resulted in the liberation of Bangladesh from its colonial overlords, and uh, and almost led the war world to nuclear war. And we're like, oh my god, this is a crazy story. But also, like, a wall is not going to stop the mm. the, the the insufferable thing, uh, you know, uh, impacts of climate change, right? Mm. And India is just building this wall, and they're like, okay, well, if all of you guys get hit by another cyclone, it'll be okay because we have a little wall with guys with machine guns on it, and <laughs> and and you just know that this is a boiling point, like this is going to eventually spark some other sort of conflagration. So that's how the idea of the vortex came together. You know, my co-author has been my best friend for years. Jason, Michael, and I were in. Uh, Bangladesh, and we realized that this was the perfect allegory for talking about climate change, right? Because yeah. you have this this point, which all which was the deadliest storm in history. We have the response of building a wall by India, and you have the 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 Indian politicians saying, "Look, it's going to happen again at any time." And you know that in when we uh, we'll start talking about the vortex here in a second, that as this. Um, kicked forward in 1970, it almost led to nuclear war between the USA and USSR. So these like small little conflagration points are actually uh, sites of, of international conflict. So, well, I read the book, which is a, a feat in and of itself, because I'm, I'm a really slow reader. First of all, I didn't know that Pakistan used to be broken up into two different countries mm -hmm. or two different parts of the country or whatever, you know. Um, how did that happen? Was that the, the British going in and just cutting it all up like they did all around the world? Yeah, exactly. You know, in 19, uh, before 1947, um, India was this enormous region, which is now um, Pakistan, India, and uh, Bangladesh. And um, I don't think Myanmar was part of it at that point. Um, and then during partition, so this is the, the moment where, uh, you know, the, the it, Gandhi has been organizing, you know, there's this big nonviolent mm -hmm. movement. At the same time, there's actually a violent movement in India that we never talk about where they're throwing bombs in the in the, the parliament. Uh, the, the British could not hold 
India anymore. Mm -hmm. And they sent this guy, uh, Lord Montbatten, in to sort of draw arbitrary lines around religious, um, uh, you know, communities and said, Ali, Ali, Oxen for you guys can go split up. It's a mm -hmm. little more complicated than that, but mm -hmm. we'll just leave it there for now. And millions of people spread over the border. And so the, 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 the way it works is India, roughly the borders you see, you can see on the map today, the little triangle with the arm. And then it's hugging uh, uh, east, sorry, it's, it's hugging uh, west Pakistan, and then east Pakistan's on the left. And that's one country because it's majority Muslim country. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, millions of people die as they migrate and and hack each other to pieces. And then um, all of the the locus of political power is in Islamabad, which is in West Pakistan, mm -hmm. and in East Pakistan is where most of the population is, and a lot of the agrarian money and just sort of like resources. And uh, East Pakistan, sorry, West Pakistan treats East Pakistan as like a colonial um, subject. And, they, and yeah. just like the British extract all the resources <clears throat> they can, they don't speak the same language. It, it's totally divided. All they are are Muslims uh, all together. Mm -hmm. And that's really not enough to hold this um, ridiculous uh, situation together. And, you know, in about 20 odd years, um, that was no longer tenable. And there's always mm -hmm. these revolutionary movements that are going on and Pakistan always responds by killing people mm -hmm. uh, and arresting people to sort of quell that 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 situation and and after about 20 years and we have like a series of terrible dictators in Pakistan all in the uh, west side and they um and, and we get to this one guy named Yahya Khan who comes into office and he has like one mission. He's appointed essentially. He has one mission, which is to run free and fair elections for the first time mm -hmm. ever. And then so that, uh, that's Pakistan, his, that's his motivation. He wants to be like the George Washington of of Pakistan. Yes, I mean he's a he's a like a, a, a military guy, very efficient. He built Islamabad with like you know without corruption, which like never happens in this region. Mm -hmm. um, and he was actually a very good military leader. Um, also like World War II hero, um, imprisoned by the Nazis, you know, did, did, had his whole career there. Um, but he's not necessarily a great military leader in the year, in the, 19, <clears throat> in the 1965 war between India and Pakistan. Uh, he basically lost the war for Pakistan because he was such a bad general. Um, <laughs> so, so then, you know, here's the situation. He has the, the job of, of putting in the first free and fair election, and that's going to be in uh, the end of November, early December, I think. Um, and then as he's doing this, a giant storm is brewing in the Bay of Bengal and it comes up and just wreaks havoc on absolutely everything right before the election. And it hits this, you know, it hits the most populated area on Earth. Meanwhile, um, and we'll get it, we can get into this a, a little later, but Yaya is in China setting up Nixon and Kissinger's famous meeting with the with with Mao Zedong mm -hmm. uh, and Zhao Enlai, and and which is going to like open up trade markets and trade and diplomatic relations between the United States and China. So he's doing all of that, and the storm hits right before the election, and then he doesn't do any aid relief. Millions more people die, and this um, results in flipping the election uh, against uh, um, you know the colonial overlords. And you were saying that um, East. You're saying Pakistan, I guess. Is that the appropriate way of saying it? I'm going to assume it is since you've been there and I have not. Yeah, Pakistan, not Pakistan. OK, yeah, Pakistan. Pakistan. I will get in the habit of <laughs> I will get in the habit of putting my eyes in the back of my mouth. Um, Pakistan. Um, but East Pakistan was more populous. Yes. And those were the Bengalis. Those were the Bengalis. The, ethnically, the Bengalis. And uh, that that is a sect of, of Islam, right? Um, no, Bengali is like a language group. Um, it, oh, okay. It's like it's like English speaking. So Bengalis are so they aren't different um, religious sects. They're like more cultural, mm -hmm. ethnic. Okay. Right. So 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 Bengal. All right. Let's get even more confusing. Okay. So okay. in India, Calcutta is in uh, West. Is it East? It, it's it's West Bengal. I don't know why it's called West Bengal. Um, but so Calcutta is, is uh, you know, Bengali people. And during this partition, they actually divided the state of Bengal in two. And so all the Muslims went right and all of the Hindus went left into, okay. into these two areas. So um, uh, Beng uh, what was then East Pakistan was full of all of the Bengali Muslims that came over from the Calcutta side. And, and, and so you have a, a, a majority Islamic um, you know, postage stamp size uh, mm. area of East Pakistan, but very populous. 
very populous. And like, yeah, Bangladesh is going to be the most populous country per square meter, you know, very soon. Dhaka is going to have like 40 million people in like 2040 or something. Oh, it's yeah. like, it's, it is insane. Um, and it's, it's also just like a very fertile region, right? If you think about all of the rivers coming mm. down, the Ganga come in, uh, going into the delta of of Bangladesh, basically all of Bangladesh is a delta. So, mm. it, and that is like, you know, the most fertile ground ever. Yeah. And it's extremely low sea level. Like it's like inches above sea level, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's something like 40% of the country is like one meter above sea level. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. It is absolutely insane. Okay, so we have Yahya Khan, who is trying to set up fair elections for the first time in Pakistan. At the same time, he's trying to arrange a meeting between China and the U.S. to mm -hmm. solidify himself as an international player, basically. And then this storm hits in East Pakistan. And um, was it a particularly, and it became known as the Bola Cyclone mm -hmm. because of a particular island that it hit, right? Yeah, so one of the one of the several islands that yeah. were basically um, depopulated completely uh, was Bull Island. That was the bigger. It's not, that was not actually the worst um, death area, but maybe at the time because they couldn't even get reporters into the yeah. into Hatia and and, and uh, Manpura, the other islands were basically eradicated, and they just called it Bola because they, could, they couldn't get any worse than this. Yeah, <laughs> little did they know. Um... So, but was this a particularly massive storm or did it just hit at just the right angle in the right place and it had a storm surge that just kind of like wiped out the population centers? I mean, or, or, or was it, was it actually a math, like one of the biggest storms ever kind of thing? No, it was, I think it was like a category four hurricane. So it wasn't okay. even the, the, the highest level category, but we still were having sustained winds of at least 140 miles an hour. So pretty big, but it's, it's really the timing when it hit, right? So it comes yeah. in during a full moon so you already have high t and at high tide and that's when it makes landfall so but when you're dealing with islands that are only like three feet off of sea level when you have a 20 foot storm surge the only people who survive were the people who climb trees and stay there overnight and that's uh, one of the characters in the book um mm -hmm. sorry i'm forgetting his name at this point but um but Muhammad yeah Muhammad high right Muhammad high Muhammad high that's our, right like, yeah. our, our farmer turned revolutionary, right? And he, he yeah. so he spent his whole family is in this like you yeah, know tell tell the story. It's it's an amazing story. So Muhammad High is, is like a teenager, eighteen years old, loves football, you know, fishes during the day, and like dreams of bigger things in his life. And he's in this tiny little like clay village, uh, clay house. And uh, the, the storm surge cars coming in. So all of his family members are like, okay, we, we've been through a lot of cyclones before. We'll just gather up all the animals. And we'll all just sit in our like in our two-story house and, and wait out the storm. And then meanwhile, there's all these like weird warnings coming in off the radio system that they'd never heard before because Pakistan has just instituted a new cyclone warning system and oh, no one knew wow. what it meant. Uh, oh my God. You know, yeah, it's like you switch the red lights and the green lights on all of your and you did, and all of your traffic signs in your in your in your building in your city, and uh -huh. then you just don't tell anyone you did it. And so, so, like, so this is a literal ooh. perfect storm. It, it it hits at just the right time, at just the right angle, mm -hmm. um, at just the right place. The people didn't have the right warnings that they normally had, so they didn't know what to do. And then it's twenty meters of sea level rise over this this area that's only one meter above sea level. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect storm is what should have been the name of the book, but Sebastian Younger already took yeah, that. It's already been taken, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it comes in. And also like we have other warnings. There's uh, we have the first weather satellite actually catches the cyclone coming in 1970 is the Itos one. And uh, the NOAA has the, has the like received the images, but didn't look at them <laughs> in time. No. Cause they're like, well, what's our new technology? And that, that satellites up there. And then also India has a boat that goes out into the storm because at that point, other than the, the satellite system that no one knew how to use, you would send boats into storms. And if they sound, found big waves, they'd report back to headquarters that there were some problems. India has a boat sink. Uh, the Mahajag Mitra sinks. 50 people go down and they send out some very dramatic radio messages. Uh, but India's like, well, Pakistan's our enemy, so we just won't say anything. <laughs> and and so, the, so no warning goes that way either. So like all of these opportunities to actually save lots of lives don't come in. And meanwhile, Mohammed High is on his island, 
the storm starts coming up and he the water starts filling up his house and like, you know, his, his family is reading the Quran, trying to pray the storm away. It's not working. And they climb up to the second story of their house and the water keeps on going up and Mahai Mahai um, actually breaks through the roof, through the tin roof and is telling his family to come up as they're sort of, you know, their chins are just above the water level. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, he decides that he has to jump to a tree and he'll get all of his family to go to the palm tree that's right next to the house. He jumps on it and it call, is calling back to his family for hours as these, you know, 140 mile an hour winds are all around him and his entire family drowns that, that, and, 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 you know, they all die. And, and then the eye goes over him and there's this dead silence, you know, where, I don't know if you've ever been in the eye of a hurricane uh, where you are, but you have this, this, you know, raging winds. And then in a second, it all turns to nothing. It's like, it's just dead calm. And you're like, whoa, is it over? And then, and then, and then he looks around, he talks to an uncle, a, a neighboring house, and, and there's only one survivor over there. And then the storm all kept back up again. Mm -hmm. And he has to hold on for another six or seven hours. Um, we also interviewed one guy and we didn't use him in the book, um, but he spent the whole night in a tree with um, a, a nest of king cobras because they all oh, tried to escape too. And the cobras weren't going to go bite him because they were, you know, also traumatized by this. Yeah. Event. And so he spent the whole night there with these king cobras. And, um, and we, you know, when the storm finally ends, high comes down, every single one of his family members has died. Um, uh, some of them are still in the house. Many have floated down or up river. Uh, and he spends the next day or maybe actually probably weeks, um, burying 50 people in his front yard. And then the whole island of 50,000, probably uh, 40,000 of them died in this event. Hey, I'll get back to my conversation with Scott in just a second. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Nebula. Now, I'm sure you've heard me talk about Nebula at this point, but let me tell you why Nebula is important to me as a creator. Um, I did a video a couple of years back about the Bhopal gas tragedy. It was the deadliest industrial accident of all time. It took place in India in the 80s. It was awful. But it's an important story about the dangers of greed and corruption. I think it's a story worth telling. And it ran just fine on YouTube for two years, no problem. Well, recently... YouTube decided it was too controversial and it got age restricted. So if you ever wondered if YouTube was getting more stringent with their content, there's your answer. And here's the deal. I'm not even really mad about it, honestly. I mean, when a platform is supported by ads, they have to rigorously monitor the content on there. That's just how it is. And, but that's exactly why Nebula was created. On Nebula, the platform is supported by you. So you get to see everything. No algorithm getting in the way. No algorithm deciding what you get to watch. As a creator, I get to post how and what I want without having to adhere to some random tricks of an algorithm. And what this means for you is that you get more and better content, ad-free and earlier than everybody else. And there's a ton of Nebula original series that you can't find anywhere else. In fact, because YouTube's gotten so ban happy, I started a whole series on Nebula called Forgotten Atrocities. It's where I take a look at some of the worst moments in human history that have unfortunately been kind of forgotten to history. Yeah, some of it gets dark, but I think it's important to remember these mistakes of the past and the sacrifices that came with them. But unfortunately, that doesn't really matter to the YouTube algorithm. It does matter on Nebula. So if you're ready for content that matters, head over to Nebula and give it a look. You can find me at nebula.tv slash conversations with Joe. Just sign up there and you're off to the races. Um, I've got my YouTube videos up there as well, ad free, uh, as well as both audio and video versions of this podcast. So once again, it's nebula.tv slash conversations with Joe. Go take a look for yourself. Now on with the show. One at, or only one out of five people survive basically. Right, one out of five in this in this one island, um, yeah. and other other islands were even even worse. God. Are there any other stories like that from from your your interviews that didn't make it in the book? That uh... mm -hmm. tons, tons. Actually, this is what, what is one of the problems with writing narrative nonfiction, right? So we we write the story as factually present as possible. Yeah. We're also trying to be storytellers and we're, we're always trying to find the line of where you sort of like stray too far into composite characters and, mm -hmm. and facts that, that, you know, oh, we don't know how do we get to A to B. And we tried to steer very hard on the, like, we can back up everything we say in here. Um, but it would have been great if we could have used the Cobra story. Um, there's another story later, there's a war that sort of breaks out in this region. And there's a man who's fed to tigers by the Pakistani military. <laughs> Um, very famous thing, you know, and there's just, there, there are tons and tons and tons of stories that come out of um, the the cyclone and then the 71 war, 72 war that happens mm -hmm. afterwards. Uh, but, you know, when we're, 
when we're trying to focus on just one person, the, the, or one set of persons and living through their experiences, you have to toss like 90% out, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. But I get to talk to you and tell you stories. So that's, well, that, that, that's this perfect opportunity to do that. Um, I want to stay with the cyclone for a minute um, mm -hmm. before we get into everything that followed because good Lord, but um, so you're talking about the Noah had this new satellite. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, I'm real. I'm trying to stick with the, the, the storm for just a second because the, sure. I want to get as many details on that as we, as we can muster. Uh, but there's, there's so much stuff that, that came afterwards just to jump ahead a little bit, but there was something in the book about, um, that one of the, one of the guys came over there and, uh, somebody was like, oh, this solved our problem. This wiped out mm -hmm. 600,000 problems. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're, um, you're in Dallas or Houston, Dallas. you're in Dallas, right? So this may not be useful, to you, but there's a Houston weatherman, a very famous name, Neil Frank, mm -hmm. uh, who was, you know, uh, KHOU. Is that the, is that the, the station? Yeah, I, think so. I yeah. think it's KHOU. He's the, he was the, the weatherman there for 30 years, I believe. But before that, he was the director of the National Hurricane Center. And at this time, uh, it, he was actually just under, he was the assistant director when the storm hits. And he's been cataloging, you know, he's watching cyclones come. He's very excited about this new satellite that he's got like his, his mittens on, um, but they haven't figured, you know, worked out all the bugs yet. So he gets this, the, the film roll uh, late to develop it. And, um, and, you know, the New York Times reports on the storm before he knows what's going on. And, uh, and then, but he gets tasked with flying out to um, East Pakistan to figure out how everything went wrong. And the World Bank gives him a bunch of money to write this report. And it just so happened that his boss, a guy named Gordon Dunn at the International Hurricane Center had designed the hurricane warning system that, you know, the red light, green light, where, where they, nobody they understood the traffic signals. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he flies out to East Pakistan. And meanwhile, like, you know, they just suffered 500,000 people dead. Like this is a major human catastrophe. It has exacerbated the ethnic violence. It has exacerbated mm. all of the conflicts. Everyone is very heated. Um, the, the president is saying we should hang all the weathermen because he's trying to just put it on the weathermen's mm. fault. They didn't warn us at the time. And uh, Neil Frank is a weatherman. <laughs> coming to East Pakistan and, and at nights he's hearing like a rifle fire going off uh, and he writes this report where after he, he interviews generals and other weathermen and all the, all the people in the bureaucracy in Dhaka uh, one general he goes to sort of sits him down you know sort of off the record let's turn off the microphone he says you know that cyclone solved half a million of our problems uh, which in it and the the, the general he was speaking to was from the other side of Pakistan, right? The Urdu mm -hmm. Punjabi side of Pakistan. And they're like, well, we're not going to have the, the half a million deaths is half a million more votes that we get in mm -hmm. our, you know, half a million more votes that don't go in our, our way. So this was actually sort of pretty good, Neil, you know, and chum chum hit him on the, hit him on the shoulder. And Neil Frank is just like aghast at this. And meanwhile, that general is also saying, you know what we need from you world bank person, the way we're going to solve this problem in the future is if you give us, um, uh, aircraft, air transport planes, those Hercules, C-130 Hercules uh, aircraft, which you've probably seen on like military or the big gray airplanes mm -hmm. like you can hold like t eight tanks in and drill them into your battlefield. Yeah. This general was like, the World Bank needs to give us these Hercules because we need better hurricane surveillance. And Neil Frank is, that's crazy. I don't know why you would need the Hercules. And he says, no, you can't have it, which was really good because at that same time, Neil Frank was there talking to this guy. Pakistan is meanwhile loading up troops from the other side of Pakistan, because they have this problem, they have to get all of their troops from uh, Islamabad and Karachi all the way around their, their military enemy, India, into Bangladesh, mm -hmm. because they have some plans that they're working on. And mm -hmm. the Hercules would have been great. So Neil Frank actually plays this role where he's like, you don't get my Hercules from the, the World Bank, and he stops that from happening, which is marginally good. <laughs> he prevented a, a slightly less deaths, possibly. Yeah. After half a million people die from a storm. Um, so what was what killed the most people in this storm? Was it was it the storm surge and just the, the drowning and stuff? Was it um, uh, who, who was the comedian that was talking about I get Ron White? He said 
it's not that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like it, picking up debris and smashing people and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Like it, it was mostly drowning uh, because, you know, again, it, 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 this is 20 feet of water when you've only got three feet of land. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a lot of people just don't know how to swim. Like, you know, I know in America, like most of us learn to swim at some point, right? But uh, you, you often take lessons and like, there's not a culture of that necessarily. Well, but there's uh, also swimming in a swimming pool and swimming in the middle of a friggin' hurricane. Those are two different things. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. I've never swum in a hurricane, but I yeah. imagine it's much more difficult. I would not but, like to learn. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, compound that with not, not no knowledge of swimming. And then you have yeah. this, just like this, this, this terrible thing. And yeah, it's just people drowning. You have, you have just this massive wall of water pushing up, you know, 50, 60 miles into, um, the Delta and it's, yeah, it's, it, that's how people die. And when, you know, later we have these accounts of people going down the river to the most affected areas and, you know, they'll, they'll be in the boat and, you know, there'll be this smell that's coming in like that's not a very nice smell and they'll see like a body floating in the water and then more and more bodies until the boat can't even navigate because there's so many corpses and they're worried that their propeller is going to get full of human hair i mean this is oh a God. true nightmare uh, see it's those details that that get me little things like that um hmm so the aftermath of that, I imagine there's a lot of uh, diseases that went around. Mm -hmm. So uh, cholera is obviously the first one that, that yeah. hits, right? Um, you know, when you have decaying bodies, you get cholera in the water supply. And uh, we don't, and one of the problems with this, again, in 1970, with so few survivors in these areas, you don't even get information coming out of those islands for weeks. Uh, yeah. You know, you have a couple flybys, Yaya Khan actually flew over the affected area about a week later. He's like, hmm, that doesn't look so bad. He's drinking a beer. He throws the beer out the window. I mean, it's so hard to know exactly what happened. There's only about two photographs of the storm, which is crazy wow. to think about. Like when you, you know, there's more photos of alleged Bigfoot than there are of the Bola <laughs> Cyclone. <laughs> is there a photo of Bigfoot in the Bola Cyclone? That would be the. There will be after this there. conversation. Let's Let's Photoshop that. Uh, yeah, so experience with Bigfoot, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, actually. We can talk about that later. But um, So, okay, so, so the storm hits, um, half a million people dead, more, more than that even. Um, entire islands depopulated, just using the word depopulated about what happened. That's just an insane word to use there. Um, it's it's, it's kind of hard to even fathom in our daily lives the, you know this is the thing about talking about atrocities right i mean i'm watching you struggle to even form words to ask questions and you're a professional interviewer right like well, how do, <laughs> how does somebody wrap their mind around a catastrophe that none of us can understand right that, yeah. that we have no frame it's like calculating to a billion you're like what's a billion that sounds big and 50 billion sounds even like more but like yeah, a billion yeah. you can't even understand it and it's the same thing with all of this death that's going on it's it's it, 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 it it's like a city is in one place and then there's a desert afterward and now that the survivors walk into the desert like hmm, this looks pretty deserted and you, you we, we cannot even hold on to the concept of the suffering that happens and the person's family being ripped apart. Someone's grabbing onto their mother and the, her finger is loose and he's like, mom, and then he sees her drown in front of her. This is happening at a, um, a, a 100,000 uh, event uh, momentum, right? Mm -hmm. Where 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 you're, you're seeing so much death, it hurts so badly for so many people. And yet we here cannot comprehend it because we, you know, uh, and I hope for most of our viewers, we have not suffered this sort of trauma, right? Mm -hmm. We look at like an avocado shortage and we get like a little nervous, right? And, 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 and here we're talking about entire cities disappearing. I mean, how many people died in Hiroshima? Like, you know, 300,000, is that right? Like, this is worse than Hiroshima. I would have to look it up. I feel like it wasn't even that many, but... Um... So you just talk about trauma like that. That's an interesting thing to, to talk about, too. I mean, like how how do communities recover from something like that? What does that lead to? And I think that ties into this story pretty well, because um, they did not get the help that they needed from the people that were supposed to be taking care of them. And so that led to this backlash against um, 
the government of West Pakistan, Pakistan, mm -hmm. and uh, and because uh, Bengali or East Pakistan, I'm using the wrong words here. Sorry, but because um, it was confusing, more... right? The country formerly known as Bangladesh. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it wasn't Bangladesh though. at the time, so right. I'm trying to like parse the words just right. <laughs> um, but even though. It, they wiped out so many people in that storm or they lost so many people in that storm. It was still very populous and right. the government in West Pakistan wasn't taking care of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there, is there anything to talk about there in terms of like why the relief effort didn't oh, yeah. come? Was it because they were just like, let's get rid of these people? Yes. I mean, there was a, there was a will, the army. So after the storm hits, um, you have this woman named Candy Rhodey who's from Boston. She's a school teacher from Boston who's living in Dhaka. Um, uh, and they tried, basically, she tried to, do her husband tried to dodge the draft by moving to, to Dhaka. And so she's there. Oh, and, oh, by yeah, draft. There's a war in Vietnam going on right oh, now. Oh, yeah, that's important if, too. Yeah. If, if you missed this whole context, 1970, yeah. what was going on? Right yeah. next door, there's, a, there's Vietnam going on. So this is maybe why this is not such a big <laughs> Um, event in our in our in our collective consciousness. So yeah, we're, we're focused Rhodey, on something else. Yeah, Candy Rhodey is in um, Dhaka, uh, and she gets the newspaper the next day after a, a slightly bad storm in Dhaka because Dhaka is significantly upriver. Mm. Um, and she's like, "Oh, that sounds bad. Look, you know, maybe fifty people died in this region. You know, that's so terrible because the newspapers have no idea what yeah. happened." Yeah. Uh, and so she's like, well, let's just go gather up some supplies from neighbors and go down and, and sort of figure this out. So she, you know, starts calling up friends and saying, hey, can we get some food and stuff to bring down to to the Delta, to an island called Hatia? going to bring a casserole. Mm -hmm. We'll help them recover. And uh, over the next week, as she gets more information, she calls up different um, you know, uh, friends that she knows, working phone lines, whatever, they, they start realizing that, that, that it's a, a pretty enormous problem. And, and, and over the course, and this is like truly heroic, Candy Rhodey somehow in the course of like two weeks creates the largest civilian driven aid response in world history. Right. She's wow. calling up friends and, 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 you know, people in Dhaka are donating, not the foreigners, weirdly. It's mostly like sort of um, uh, Bengalis who are donating, but also she calls people internationally. So there's Germans, there's Russians, there's Americans, there's all these people suddenly donating stuff. She gets aircraft flown in to Dhaka to start, you know, um, getting supplies to the Delta. But the army um, leaves those supplies on the tarmac quarantines them and says, no, there are supplies. So she's dealing, she's actually fighting the Pakistani military, mm -hmm. um, just trying to get food to the Delta because the army really doesn't care if they die. They actually sort of want more people to die. And, and so there's this, that one of the underlying tensions in the book is just see, seeing like people want to be involved with this. People want to help. And, and yet when you have a government, which, which does not care about your people, mm -hmm. it, um, you know, it, it's very hard to get any, A, it's very hard to get anything done, but also it undermines that government's legitimacy because why have a government at all? It's so that in times of, I mean, you know, to, to make a society that works, right? To supply ser services, but also like when the shit goes down, you want your government to be there. When you get invaded by a neighbor, you mm -hmm. want your government to be there. When you get hit by an earthquake, you want somebody to call. And the Pakistani government did not do anything. And which was a particularly strategically bad move when you're like two weeks before a national election. Right. I mean, if even, even the most like libertarian people, I think would agree that if the government has one single function, it's to take care of their citizens in times of emergency, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but there's also the saying, never let a good disaster go to waste. Right. And that's what they did. They just let it, they just let it run its course and wipe out as many of these, uh, these people as possible. Yeah, so, I mean, you can get even terrible politicians. Um, all they have to do is just show up and be like, let's save the day. Like Giuliani, right? Sure. America's yeah. mayor, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> he shows up and he's like, we should clean up downtown. And everyone's like, that's such a great idea. You're the best leader in the world. And you know, it turns out that maybe he's not so great. And, you know, <laughs> looking more recently. Yeah, it's, it's kind like, of amazing. He was like a beloved figure for a while there. I remember. Uh, and, and that's all Yahya Khan had to do, right? Yahya mm -hmm. Khan had to be like, we're trying our best to deliver the supplies that this woman raised to bring, and, and put them on our boats and bring them to this area. And he didn't want to do it. And 
and it just becomes this rallying point. And, you know, politicians use disasters all the time to their advantage, mm -hmm. right? And you can supply aid to some places, you cannot supply aid to others. And I think that Yahya Khan just thought he was really savvy because the way he was thinking was idiotic. He was really thinking that these votes are going to come in, and if and if if half a million people can't vote, then I'll be fine. But what he didn't understand is that uh, uh, East Pakistan at that time had. You know, it, all the Bengalis voted, but there was like 50 parties they could vote for. So they always split their vote. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. his party had, you know, more unified um, interest from from, you know, the other side of Pakistan. That's mm -hmm. how they gained control. But what happened now is that after this storm and the, the capricious way that um, Paka, that uh, Yahya Khan's forces did not deliver aid, um, the opposite, the Beng internal Bengali opposition dropped out. They're like, we're all going to support this guy, mm -hmm. uh, a guy named Sheikh Mujib. And um, and and they all said, we're going to support Mujib. And they all did. Mujib went to the islands, was like, hi, guys, I have eight blankets to pass out to the 40,000 of you who are in this refugee camp. Here you are. Here are your 40 blankets. And it goes to the next island, does the same thing again. And that was enough to make everyone say, this guy actually cares. Yeah. And so when this election actually rolls in, which is two weeks later, uh, it is such a landslide. It's like in America, if you had the Democrats and the Republicans running against each other, but one party got 78% of the vote, right? Unheard of. We're yeah, always yeah. like in these narrow yeah. margins, but it's like, it's like everyone goes over to the Bengali side and it was enough political power. I mean, this is a parliamentary um, system, so it's a little, little more confusing, sure. uh, but it, it's essentially the same as saying that, um, East Pakistan, which was the colonial um, servant, now had enough political power to rule the entire country. Mm. It's, it's like in the United States, you had, um, you know, I, I don't know, what, who, what's, what's, a, what's, a, what's a vocal minority? Sikhs, okay? Sikhs, Sikhs are now ruling America, you know, and mm. that's going to be a big upset for um, for the, the, the government. And then Yahya Khan basically says, mm, there was a lot of fake news going on. Um, this whole election was rigged, mm -hmm. and uh, and those and then he starts you know saying that Bengalis aren't real Muslims, and he said you know he has all these racial slurs. Those people eat fish, we eat real meat. We're men, they're women. You know he's got yeah, all of this yeah. stuff that he throws in there, and um, as the transfer of power is supposed to happen, Mujib is saying, hey, I can't wait to rule my my country that I won fair, free and fair. That you, you know, the election that you made happen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's go work with this, and he just basically gaslights Mujib for months. And mm -hmm. as he's gaslighting them, he's flying in tanks, he's flying in soldiers, um, you know, and before the soldiers go over, they give him the, the your, your proto jihad speech. They're like, you know, a, a, you know, the place you're going is full of fake Muslims and it's your religious duty to murder as many of them yeah. as possible. And this priest says, that's, that's the Quran. And, mm -hmm. and so it's like you see this same rhetoric being used later in ISIS and, and whatnot. And this is in some ways the modern beginning of the all of, of the Islamic terrorism that happens oh, wow. um, shortly afterwards. And so he's doing all this rhetoric. He flies all these soldiers over. It takes him a few months to set up. And then on the day that the official transfer is supposed to happen, I think that's March 25th, 1971, uh, he... Uh, you know, arrests Mujib and um, drives tanks through Dhaka and just starts murdering everyone. Uh, I mean, it's like kill them all. And we have these transcripts in the in the vortex of the radio transmissions. We're like, you're going down to Dhaka University. Yep, kill those dorms, kill everyone there. And uh, and it's you know, I think it's thirty thousand people die in the first twelve hours uh, from direct onslaught. There's like very minimal resistance because not a lot of Bengalis have guns. Um, and and people are coming in with and this is should be very important to, to realize Yahya Khan and a guy named Richard Nixon are best friends. OK, yeah. R Richard, Richard Nixon is said to have had only two friends in the world. And there was a banker in, in, in Key West and Yahya Khan. They loved each other when Yahya Khan's son had a birthday. Nixon gave, was in uh, Karachi at the time and gave his son astronaut ice cream it was before astronaut ice cream was a thing. Uh -huh. You know, it was like, it was because we just landed on the moon too. Okay. A lot of stuff's going on. Sure. And, 
And uh, Yahya Khan has bought tons of American weapons illegally. Uh, and we're, we're, we're using chafee tanks. There's uh, American fighter jets, American munitions, American mortars, all of this stuff. And it's being used against the Bengali citizens. And Richard Nixon is like fine with covering up what's going on. And because, and this is another crazy thing. So Yahya Khan was fought in World War II against the Nazis, was captured by the Nazis and learned a lot from them. So he actually is, oh, is deploying Nazi tactics against his own population or a population that he looks at as essentially Jews the way the Nazis look yeah, at Jews, which are yeah. Bengalis. Not to play devil's advocate or anything, but um, <laughs> with wonderful people like Yahya Khan, um, was his justification or his inner justification, do you think, was it like, if we let this guy from the, the Bengalis come over here and run mm. the country, there's going to be a massive backlash because we've been talking shit about them all this time, you know? And so in order to preserve the country, we have to put them down. Kind oh of. yeah. He's, he's got all those sorts of, of rhetorical. Yeah. I mean, this is like anyone saying, Hey, my election didn't go my way, but the other guy's so much worse than me. Maybe I should ignore the results of an election. I don't know yeah. who would possibly think to do that, but a lot of people, but in order to save the country, I have to end mm -hmm. democracy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, he was very much uh, in that line. I mean, you know, so I've spent my career interviewing bad people, right? I've interviewed organ traffickers, right? Uh, this guy stole a hundred kidneys from people. I will interview that guy and I'll be like, so tell me why you're a good person. He's like, well, I'm saving lives. These kidneys are going to all the right people. And, yeah. and, and I think everyone has an internal justification yeah, for why yeah. they do what they do. And Yahya Khan is no different uh, uh, than anyone else, uh, but he's also very calculating and he knows that he doesn't care about killing people. He just does not care. And I think in the seventies, maybe killing people was just sort of the way you did things. You know, we're running a, a genocide in Vietnam at the time, you know, we're killing people in Cambodia. Kissinger's involved in both conflicts at the same time. Well, uh, you point out this was only, you know, a few decades after World War II. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel like the trauma of World War II was still lingering and, and, and people maybe still saw the world in those ways and like that's how you took care of things, you know? and. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that big a deal to wage a little genocide, you know? Absolutely. It, it was, it was, you know, that there, the mindset and also with so few cameras, right. With so, mm. so little personal interaction with what's going on. Uh, you know, the, 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 the operation searchlight, which is the attack on Dhaka at first, and then the rest of the area, um, the suppression of Bengali resistance, uh, Yaya Khan did an amazing time amazing job of being sure that no journalist took photos. And there's a, this is a major scene in the book of just people trying to get photos of bodies before the bodies could be whisked off the street and burned or buried somewhere. And uh, it, it was very, very difficult. They, they rounded up all of the journalists into a place called the Intercontinental Hotel. Mm -hmm. And they, they just sort of like watched them there. And, and, you know, some journalists were able to sneak out, but not a lot of them. And it took probably six months to get really, really good information out. Now, in the present day, you're going to have webcams, you're going to have yeah. people's iPhones, the atrocities happen very, you know, under a lens immediately. Like, look what's happening in Iran right now. Yeah. Um, thousands of people are dying, which is horrendous, but it's galvanizing a world movement to be like, look, this is actually happening. Mm -hmm. After the the operations or during Operation Searchlight, uh, Nixon and Yaya could be like, well, we're, there, there were some riots in the streets and we have, we have, we have, we have curtailed the, yeah. the dissident elements. and. That was the only information that was getting out. So that's what everyone believed. And it took a while to undermine that narrative. And I think that this is a, you know, for all of the problems in social media, and there's a lot of them, um, the fact that we are able to move information quickly now does at least raise awareness of things that are going on. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I've definitely railed against social media quite a bit, but... Um the fact that everybody has a camera and an instant access to broadcast what's on that camera to the rest of the world changes a lot of things in, in situations like that. Mm -hmm. um, as, as long as they have access to the internet, I guess that's the Achilles heel there. But 
Russia yeah, but there's ways. Like there, yeah, I mean, you have Starlink. You have all sorts of ways to get information out. Even in Russia right now, they have control of the internet, but they're VPNs and whatnot. I mean, there's mm-hmm. we we are in a very different era than where we were 50 years ago when it yeah. comes to information. And the government was able to act with true impunity for months. And and their motto was essentially suppress the Bengali resistance because we do. And the, the, the ideology was like fewer Bengalis means pu- fewer people voting against us. Mm-hmm. And Yahya Khan has this quote, kill three million of them and the rest will eat out of her hands. He says this right before he murders everybody. Again, uh, where, where are the words to even discuss such a thing? Yeah, it's it, like this is always the thing, right? We again. As humans, we, we lack the conceptual ability to understand atrocities that happen at this level. Mm-hmm. We reduce them to numbers, right? We're like, well, 20,000 people died in Bosnia last week or whatever whatever it was. Yeah. And then that number, um, you, you gauge the, 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 the terror based on a number, which is just useless, right? You're just, you've, you've totally intellectualized the horrors that are perpetrated on a, on a person by person basis. And I think that most of us now um, have become immured, immured? We, we are not affected by, um, by these things that happen in the abstract. Like we're just, yeah. humans are not wired for that, right? We can see one person commit a murder and that will affect us for the rest of our lives. But if, you know, two cities over from us, 30 people got murdered, we're like, well, that was a very bad news day. Mm-hmm. And then we're able, we're able to move on. And, and um, it, it, it's a collective, it's a collective problem, right? Maybe it's a, a evolutionary, like we don't want to live in trauma, which I sort of get, but, you know, looking at something that happened only 50 years ago, in, in Bangladesh, you'd think that 3 million people dying would at least be a blip in an American history textbook, right? Mm-hmm. Sometime the, the kids in the AP classes maybe would be like, huh, Pakistan. Yeah, there was a war or something. Uh, and, and the only one that we're able to really um, stay fixated on is the, is the Jewish Holocaust in, in, mm-hmm. in World War II. And and somehow that has remained in the con- in, in consciousness for good reasons. There's a terrible thing that happened, but we also forget the genocides that happened in yeah. Russia at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and how that kicked off other, uh, you know, there was a Bengali famine that where a million people died at the same time. And these are, these are, you know, that was conducted by Winston Churchill. And we have, uh, I don't know, like, like, why is it that we don't, you answer me this, this Joe, why, de- why can't we think, and remember, you know, a couple more genocides. So uh, I mentioned that I have this Forgotten Atrocities series on on the the Nebula platform. Um, that video or that whole thing came because I was going to do a video on Forgotten Atrocities. It was going to be like five Forgotten Atrocities or something like that. And it was just going to be a, a video. And I go online to research and it was just so many of them. I was like, oh, this is a whole series. Like I can make a whole series out of this. And, um, and one of the things that stands out when you were just talking about that, like, um, I covered, well, a couple of them that I've done, I covered the Irish famine, I covered the Holodomor, which you were kind of alluding to a second ago and, you know, uh, following uh, World War II, um, in Ukraine. And it's, it's, and this is, this fits right into that pattern where there's a natural disaster and all these people die, but that's not really what kills everybody. It's, it's, it's government in action or direct action to make it worse to get rid of people that are causing them problems or whatever or just like political decisions that um are expedient to the people that are in power and they just don't want to or, or they have a, a certain you know uh political worldview and it's like well we're not going to deviate from that in order to help these people out or something that was kind of what was going on in the irish famine anyway from from my reading um but you're right. I mean, like the, the the reason why I felt like forgotten atrocities was a good name for it was because we we do tend to just move on and and forget about them or, or frame them in a way. It's like, oh, it's just a thing that happened. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, it was made to happen that way. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I will. I, I can almost guarantee there are more books written on Jack the Ripper than <laughs> you know, the, the, what happened in Ukraine after, yeah. you know, <laughs> Absolutely. after World War II. And well, reading your book, I'd, I had never heard of any of this stuff ever. 
I mean, I knew I knew of Bangladesh, and I, but I didn't know that it was once part of Pakistan, and I didn't I didn't know I, I I knew because that one video that I did that there was a bad storm that hit there, but I didn't know that it mm-hmm. led to all this other stuff. And you didn't even really get into the 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 Cold War stuff. I mean, when it when I'm reading the book and it starts getting into oh, so India is aligned with uh, the Soviet Union and Pakistan is aligned with the U.S. and so now now there's like these nuclear ships that are in the Bay of Bengal, like facing off against each other and being told to start World War Three if the U.S. carrier crosses this line. And I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> like it all just kind of came to this. I mean, clearly mm-hmm. that's the experience that you had when you were researching it and decided to write the book. It was just yeah. mind blowing. We had no idea how like just there's a fence in India and yeah. how that would spiral out into like seeing everything is absolutely interconnected. And that's the thing with globalization, right? Everything, whether or not we think it is interconnected, yeah. something that happens in Kazakhstan tomorrow could have a major effect uh, everywhere else. I mean, it's the butterfly effect, but everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. And so, yeah. So after, you know, Nixon and Yaya are best friends and uh, Indira Gandhi who's the head of India. Uh, is pretty good friends with the Kremlin. They're not actually the besties, but they but they buy a lot of weapons from them, and they're you know they they they, they do not like India because uh, sorry they do not like the United States because um, Nixon almost never used Indira Gandhi's name. He just called her that bitch. Uh, and that's that's the that's the White House. That case. sounds worse. <laughs> so. So, the, the, and that's the, I mean, maybe he just didn't like a woman running a country, right? That, mm. that, that'd, be, that'd be pretty bad. So, and Indira Gandhi, at this point, you know, she, just like we do in the Ukraine right now, she was like, well, let's fund the resistance. And yeah. she, you know, the, the, we have the military units, the Bengali military units that are able to escape, as well as citizens who will do anything to escape genocide and pick up a gun if they can. Mm. Uh, India gives them Russian weapons to fight Russian grenades, Russian... Um, you know, uh, Kalashnikov knockoffs and, and, and stuff like that. Russian artillery is brought in and uh, India is funding the resistance. They're waiting for the winter to where the ground is drier and they're and they're going to roll over and and, you know, fight yet another war against Pakistan. It's like their third war, but they had one just six years earlier. And Yahya Khan for the Yahya Khan is so insane. He's such a weird character. So Yahya Khan is a drunken womanizing crazy guy. Okay. Yeah. And who happens to do like run one decent election, which was his only really bad move <laughs> in, yeah, in yeah. a way. So he is, uh, has been chasing a Bengali woman has, has a mistress of a Bengali woman named, uh, named black beauty was, was the name that she shows up, which is, <laughs> racist um so so he's he's um uh i i think um Hosseini begum might be her name um she is his paramour and his son is also into this lady this is all going to connect to the cold war in a second but let's just stay here for a bit right so he his son's also into this woman and he's contemplating attacking india he's like maybe i shouldn't do it because it's going to be so hard and you know he, he they draw up the plans based on the israeli six-day war which is what israel used overwhelming um firepower to like level all of the countries around him and just like one mm-hmm. with air power and so he has this plan he's like well maybe i should do it maybe i shouldn't i don't know if i should actually fight india and then he finds out that his his son is sleeping with his paramour he goes over there puts a gun in his son's mouth and doesn't pull the trigger, but he's very angry, very upset uh, by this. Comes home and his wife is like, you know, I can't believe you tried to disown my son. She gets in a fight with him and he goes back and he's like, fuck it, I am going to uh, uh, declare my attack on India. Uh, And so he does. So they send overwhelming air power into North India. So again, India's in the middle, and then we have East and West Pakistan. He attacks from the left side, not the right side. He comes in and, and you know, shoots all of these bombs at the airport in Jaipur and Agra, and the military base in Agra, and puts a couple potholes in the runways, you know? <laughs> I think like one plane gets damaged. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the worst start of a war ever. Uh-huh. And, and, and then Indira Gandhi, who was in Calcutta at the time, is like, Thank you, Yahya Khan. You just attacked me, did no damage to me, and like and now, I, now this is a defensive action. It's yeah, no longer yeah. going to be an offensive action. And then she storm. You know, they they, they declare war. There's a de- mutual declaration of war, and India um, just 
decimates the Pakistani forces because they have the on the ground knowledge from the rebels. Mm -hmm. They have better weaponry. I mean, India is a much more populous, much more powerful military country. You know, I know you, we have this like sort of stalemate in Kashmir that we've, we are maybe vaguely aware of. Yeah. Um, and that was going on then as well. But that's very mountainous terrain. It's very hard to take a valley. Bangladesh is a postage stamp <laughs> and, and they just roll over it. And, uh, and, and, Yaya Khan does a couple things. He's like realizing that they're losing. So he says, kill every Bengali you can put all, dump all the gold into the sea, get rid of everything. Cause we want, if we lose this war, we want to be sure they, they can build up from nothing. Right. Yeah. And it's in that even more terrible atrocities happen then. Uh, and, and, uh, and then at the same time, he's calling up Richard Nixon. He's like, um, Dick, come on, we've got, uh, you know, that bitch is invading me and I need your help. And Richard Nixon really, really wants to send in ground troops. Um, and, uh, and so they, they bring the USS enterprise. So not, not Kirk, but, right. um, you know, the, the, it's, it's the biggest aircraft, super aircraft carrier. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, it got Tissot is the captain. He comes into the Bay of Bengal. Meanwhile, a Soviet sub fleet is coming in because they, the Soviets are friends with, with India and everyone is worried about the domino effect, right? One, one country goes down and soon the whole world will be communist. But the Soviets had the same idea, like yeah. one country goes down and everything will be capitalist. And, and they meet and uh, in the middle of the Bay of Bengal, uh, the Admiral, Rear Admiral Krugliakov gets orders that the Americans cannot cross a certain parallel. And, mm -hmm. and he's in a missile cruiser. He's got like eight subs and and he tells his subs to, you know, form a line in front of the carriers. Now, this is actually strategically dumb because if you're in a submarine, your job is to strike from um, secrecy. Right. And, yeah. uh, because otherwise you're going to get, get nuked. Yeah. You'll get destroyed. They're carrying nuclear um, uh, uh, torpedoes. And so they, the four subs surface in front of the Enterprise, being like, do not cross. This is, this is the only communication. Yeah. I was like, oh, there are Soviets in the area? Four subs right there. And meanwhile, um, Kissinger is telling Nixon, let's destroy the Indian Air Force with our nukes. Like, let's actually do it. Let's, you know, and that will take break India. And the, this, the Enterprise could do it. Like the enterprise can take out a country, no trouble at all. Mm. Uh, and then when the Soviets, um, you know, sort of surface, uh, that, that is the symbol saying, if you cross this red line, we will nuke you. And there's a very, very tense standoff. And the only reason why it doesn't happen, because Nixon and Kissinger are saying, just go right past the subs, right? Just go do mm. it. Uh, the only reason it doesn't happen is because DACA falls to the rebels. Dhaka falls to the to the, the Mukti Bahini, which is the, the freedom fighter, the Bengali freedom fighters, and the Indian army. Dhaka falls, and we were probably within an hour of total uh, nuclear Armageddon. And the only reason that we, you and I, are talking on this podcast right now is because some Bengali fighter took Dhaka. The only reason you were born the only reason anyone who's listening to this is still alive is because these dudes, these former fishermen with some mines and grenades defeated the genocidal regime of Yahya Khan. Uh, At that just is, that right moment. Mm -hmm, that is so crazy to think about. And Nixon was ready to do it. Nixon was ready to nuke the world. Kissinger was ready to nuke the world. And the Soviets were ready to defend themselves. Over a part of land that six weeks earlier they didn't care about at all. Yeah, about a year earlier, they didn't care about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And that is, it, it's terrifying to think of because we're still in a web of alliances like that. Yeah. You know, right now we have Putin saying, you know, if you do one thing wrong, I'm going to use a nuclear weapon to, and, and you're, they're using these threats, but they, they might do it. And what happens if it does? It sets off this chain of reaction. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think about a lot in this book, because I wrote it originally about climate change, right? Look, a storm starts a yeah. war. Yeah, yeah. And, and we often think about climate change, the way we talk about it is rising beachfront, you know, rising sea, sea levels will, you know, salinate the, 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 the clean, fresh water. You're gonna have beachfront properties and more storms and it's gonna be really bad. And there's gonna be some resource depletion and refugees moving around. Yeah. And that is probably a true story, right? That's generally, that, that seems logical, but that's actually not the danger of climate change. The danger of climate change are people responding to that 
and being like, oh, those refugees are coming. Let's nuke everybody. Mm -hmm. And we have the, that capability. And, and so climate change, it, it sort of feels like it's like, well, what's going to happen in, in 2100, right? In, 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 in what's going to happen in 100 years? Well, we'll be able to like, live in Colorado or not. Um, Dallas, I know you're screwed. But, uh, but Colorado, <laughs> maybe we have some, some ability to, to, to be here. That is, it's basically, that's not the concern. The concern is that something happens in Ukraine, something happens in Bangladesh, something happens in Central Africa, where because we are so interconnected, mm -hmm. everything falls apart and we go hot, into a hot war immediately. I mean, mm -hmm. just think of what happened. One tanker goes sideways in the Suez. It wasn't even really anyone's fault. Oh my fault. God, yeah, yeah. And everything ground to a halt. Mm -hmm. And we're That's... still recovering from that. Um, the, the, all we need is one thing to go terribly wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Like maybe something goes hot in Taiwan. And, and, and just the interconnected alliances and the ease at which we can launch nuclear weapons. That is the danger of climate change. Yeah. This episode is also brought to you by Kinker Boy. Um, so look, I know this is a little bit personal, maybe a little uncomfortable to talk about for some people, and you might be one of them, but some people, like myself, unfortunately, get canker sores. Not to be confused with cold sores or fever blisters. Those are the things that cluster around your lips. That's something else. That's herpes simplex. Canker sores are inside your mouth. They're round, they're red, and they make eating feel like just a hot poker being shoved into your face. They're super painful, and they can swell up to the point that you can barely even talk. Most of you probably don't get them, but those who regularly do, you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, this is something I've suffered with my whole life. It's a family thing, unfortunately, but along the way, I did stumble on a solution and that actually helps. That solution is Canker Boy. It's a vitamin supplement you take once a day, and it helps keep down your body's overproduction of inflammatory cytokines, which is actually the root cause of recurring canker sores. It's been on the market for about five years now. There's a ton of positive testimonials on Amazon. Everybody's different, of course, so your results may vary, but most people do experience a reduction in the number and severities of their ulcers within two to six weeks. So if you're one of the poor souls who deal with canker sores, it can't hurt to give it a try. Uh, just go to cankerboy.com, that's C-A-N-K-E-R-B-O-Y.com. There you'll find a link to buy it on Amazon, but we also offer it as a subscription, where if you sign up using the code CONVERSATIONS, you'll get 60% off your first two months supply. There's also plenty more information on there if you have questions. So once again, it's cankerboy.com. Go check it out and live life pain-free. Now, back to the show. I think that's really well said. Um, one of my least favorite things is whenever, and you don't see it as much anymore, but earlier on in the whole climate change um, messaging, let's say, uh, it was always like the the polar bear on an ice flow. <laughs> you know, it always used that 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 the imagery and stuff, and I was like, that's not the problem with climate change. <laughs> even the heating isn't the problem with climate change. It's all these like knock on effects that we can't even you know, imagine right now that are going to be disrupting global politics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, climate refugees and all that. Um, but yeah, it sounds like we, you were starting to say like it was originally about climate change, but it kind of became about global um, touch points. Inter and, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Global interconnected war in general. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's moderately terrifying because you know that it could happen anywhere. Like a, a cyclone is just a natural event that occurs and they're occurring more frequently now. And if, yeah. if a cyclone is a roll of the dice and you need to get the perfect roll, and maybe these are two 20 side dice if you're a D&D nerd, right? And, but if you get the wrong roll, you're fucked. Like yeah. the, whole, yeah. the whole system collapses because the whole system is interconnected because we have built a system that requires food shipments to go from one place to another place exactly on time because we've made this super efficient system. Mm -hmm. But efficiency is actually not very redundant by nature, right? Efficiency does not allow us to, to uh, adapt quickly to developing problems that undermine that system. And yeah. then when you add on top of that, the layer of like political scrambling and actual armed conflict, which none of us have really, I mean, many Americans have not really lived through bad armed conflict right. yeah. in our lifetime. Like Vietnam was the last one that was like, oh, we have ground troops that are really doing something. The both Iraq wars were pretty minor in terms of like conflicts. If you were in the 1800s writing a history about the 1800s, and you talked about like Iraq, <laughs> that would have been a very minor war. And, and Not to the people no... who are there, I think that needs to be said, but um, yeah, yeah. In, well, correct. In, I'm in, talking... the, in the big scheme of things, yeah. Right, there was no draft, right? Yeah. There was yeah, no, yeah, yeah. 
enormous marshalling of resources. Yeah, to that's Iraq, something that it was a whole different thing. I, I have conversations with younger people, which most people are younger than me now. But uh, w when I was in high school, when I turned 18, mm -hmm. I had to register for the draft. Mm -hmm. And so when we went into the first Gulf War uh, with the first Bush, um, I was terrified because the last mm -hmm. war we had been in was Vietnam and there was totally a draft. And that was all you mm -hmm. ever heard about back then was all these people like got drafted into Vietnam and all that. And um, yeah, it's funny because I've had that conversation with my wife because, you know, it's kind of a male female thing because she didn't have to register and I did and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that was like a that was like a huge thing. It was terrifying for me at the mm -hmm. time that that might happen. Like now I can't even imagine having a draft. No, it would have to be like no. an insane conflict for something like that to happen. No, I mean, Americans are insulated because we have a very like we don't need very many humans to actually do the stuff we do. We're very automated. We have lots of air power. We have mm. lots of probably robots that we don't even know about that are Drones, going to go do their yeah. <laughs> Who knows what we have? I don't know. But um, but when push comes to shove, like look what happens in Ukraine. They weren't uh, in, when Crimea was invaded. They had a very sort of like lackluster army, right? They just sort of let Crimea go. And and then they trained up because they're like, oh my God, we actually yeah. might have to fight. And there is a point, and it doesn't even take that much to get to the point where you actually have to commit large amounts of human resources. And America is not immune from this. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have historically thought we were because we were on sort of a nice geographical location. Canada and Mexico are not likely to attack us. Mm -hmm. uh, but because we're so interconnected now, uh, it absolutely could happen. You know, I, I don't want to get too political. Uh, no, Joe, let's get political. Well, the, like, well, yeah. But my listeners. <laughs> yeah. So you have spent some time in some pretty rough places, let's say, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And you've seen some shit go down. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love to hear your perspective on things that are happening in the United States today. Have, have, over the last, let's say, six years or so, have you seen things that were kind of like red flags or warning signs for you that were troubling? And I mean, the, the attack on the Capitol was a, was terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, not acknowledging the election was terrifying. Mm -hmm. And those had the seeds to go very badly. Now, I don't know if they would have. Right. I, I think the insurrection was, as far as insurrections go, pretty minor. Like no one was yeah. actually hung up you know, by, a, uh, by a, a, a street lamp, you know, yeah. like the, the guy, people going in there were armed, but barely armed. Right. Some fl some some flags and some, maybe a couple guns here and there. Yeah. But uh, but the the willingness to do it is what was what was terrifying. And I think mm -hmm. we have a rhetoric now where we are so divided. Uh, that we don't really view the other side as human and we don't even talk to other mm -hmm. people, right? We don't actually know what your Republican or Democratic neighbor actually thinks. We just think of the, the caricature of that person. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we, we put that in the mind and we think of the, the very worst thing that AOC ever said or the very, very worst thing that Marjorie Taylor Greene has ever yeah. said. And we're like, well, that's what they all think. Yeah, and yeah. and then when you start thinking that, we're like, well, I got to go get armed <laughs> or whatever, whatever it is that you're thinking like that. And and that that sort of polarization is very unhealthy for democracy. And mm -hmm. it tends it tends towards authority, um, authoritarian rule, because that's what people want. They want a strong leader in yeah. those events, whether it's going to be a liberal leader or a fascist leader or whatever it is, you're going to want a strong person. And there's another um, takeaway, though, that I had, which is not is just being talked about, I think, in the last year or so. Uh, like more systematically in America, but it's that. So I was in central India doing a story on the Salwajudam, which I'm sure you all know about them, right? Oh, the Salwajudam, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a civilian it's my favorite dish. Sorry, <laughs> a civilian counterinsurgency run by the government. Um, so they were arming basically local militias to fight communists that have been the Naxalites were fighting in central India for about 50 years. Okay, most people don't know anything about this conflict. Fine. But what, what happened is, is the communists, the Naxalites, were able to establish a beachhead and, and get a lot of public support because the government was not supplying uh, um, 
you know, resources and like, you know, infrastructure, and most importantly, justice into the region, a sense of justice. So what the Naxalites did is they actually created courts, right? They actually, their big innovation was to run a court system, which was a kangaroo court and it was terrible mm -hmm. in like almost every way, right? Yeah, People yeah. would be executed, it was, it was shitty, but someone could be like, look, I got this problem. And, and, and can you guys solve it? And, and enough people looked at that court as legitimate that, that they, they, they sustained this movement because India didn't have, have an answer. Now, when we see a justice system break down, that if you, do, if you don't feel like you can get justice in whatever form that you mm. think of that coming in, if you don't think you can get that, then you have the, the ultimate seeds for revolution, for violent conflict. Because right. if, if I'm like here and like, you know, someone shoots my neighbor and, and the government won't do anything because because that neighbor was politically aligned in a good way. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet in America, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but there is this sense now that the way our Supreme Court works and, and a lot of lower uh, 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 point is that the rule of law is, is, is um, shaky at the moment you feel mm -hmm. it feels like things are capricious and it and to and it, uh, years before that there were the conservatives were feeling that it was capricious and now the liberals feel that it's capricious and if it gets worse if we undermine the, the validity of that branch or if that branch undermines its own validity then we have uh, the the underlying flash the, the underlying circumstances that can lead to flashpoints yeah yeah that's that's an, that's interesting. Um, thank you for sharing that because that's that's something I I um, I have been keeping some some eyes on is the I guess people feeling like the Supreme Court is not not legitimate anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a good thing. <laughs> no. um, f for me, one of the I, I still remember. Um, when Trump was first elected, actually it was after his inauguration. I remember I was at the gym and the news was on and it was when they were claiming that it was the most people, Sean Spicer up on the things, the most people have ever shown up to an, an inauguration mm -hmm. ever of all time when it clearly wasn't, mm -hmm. it, you know, you could see with your own eyes. And it was like, I remember just seeing that and being like, Oh, this is different. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. like, don't believe your eyes. Don't believe the news, fake news, mm -hmm. the enemy of the people and that kind of stuff. I was like, that is rhetoric that we have not seen before. And that's mm -hmm. super dangerous rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, policy positions and all that aside, like that was what scared me about those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like actual policy that happened in the Trump administration, um, I think there was more hysteria about the policy. Like you read the New York, Fair, New York Times. Yeah, it's like, yeah dude tweeted something there was a yeah. freaking typo in the tweet or like yeah, whatever yeah. or you know he's gonna commit genocide like there was stuff that was way overblown like mm -hmm. way overblown in that and i think that we overreact um and and then we dehumanize the other side and, yeah. you know i am you know you if you've been listening to me you probably know that i end up on the left side of the spectrum um <laughs> but i think i think the left is just is is almost as insane as the right uh, in, in a lot of ways <laughs> and and i don't think that we have real political diversity in America like you got this party you got that party this party and like I'm always yeah. going to go one way and then the, the, the person on the other side is always going to go the other way but like do like we need more choice like we need I did a video about ability. that recently yeah it, it's so worrying and um and I don't know how to solve it I'm not a solver of these of these issues I just see yeah. the the problems emerging I mean ranked choice voting that would be good I don't know if that's going to solve everything but it would be be better than what we have. Yeah, yeah. And I think you did a video on, on that too. Didn't you do something yeah, yeah. on the, on the, right around uh, the election, uh, electoral yeah. college as well? Uh, uh, I may have done that a long time ago, but it was basically just, you know, I, I, tend, I like to think of myself as a systems guy. Like we, we love to like mm -hmm. dig into our in, entrenched ideologies and stuff like that. But really mm -hmm. it's about the system that allows those ideologies to, to mm -hmm. flourish or to take hold. Um, so I was like, what, how, how do we change the, the system of voting so that we still have free and fair elections and mm -hmm. everything, but mm -hmm. it gives us more choice. And it, I was just fascinated by the idea that like, just the way we count the votes and the way we oh, structure yeah. the ballots mm -hmm. could have a massive impact on having more choices in who we mm -hmm. vote for on, um, 
uh, less polarization. Like right now, we're kind of incentivized. The politicians are incentivized to go to yeah. the extremes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't we change that? Why don't we? Why don't, how about we incentivize them to come to the middle? You know, it feels like that would be a, a better way of doing yeah. things. Yeah, a little constitutional, um, you know, convention with where it wasn't baked in at the, at the beginning. I mean, we need some sort of refreshing going yeah. on. And I did a I did a video about the like a, a, a three four months ago about like Black Lives Matter and Thin Blue Line. We have these two symbols yeah. that are very divisive, right? You know, people yeah. have like, are very divided on these symbols. But if you actually sit back and, and, and just look at the text of the symbol, you know, we are so good at reading subtext. We see that, that the Thin Blue Line flag, and we know that that person is a gun toting, you know, yeah. racist. We know everything we need to know about him just from everything. That we need, right. And that Black Lives Matter, same thing. This person's a black nationalist and doesn't yeah. believe in, in government or whatever, whatever yeah. is the, yeah. the, the, the subtext there. But if you actually look at the symbols and, and probably the reason why the person put that symbol on their car, right, it, it's it, they're both saying we just want to have a country that abides by law. Right. At the yeah, end of the day, yeah. it's, like, it's like Black Lives Matter is like Black lives literally matter. Like, yeah, don't we just want justice people. for the people when things go wrong. And yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 then but then it's the sub and, and, and then it's the subtext that we pile on. And some of that subtext is there. Right. It's not not going to say it's not there. But but we are so, at, um, you know, I have a friend who's a who was editing a, a, a newspaper. This is the top editor of a newspaper. And he was like, all of my reporters who are like the 20, 25 year old range, they they are they're experts at reading subtext, but they have no ability to read the text. They can't just <laughs> see what the words actually are on the page to be like, what is this person actually talking about? Yeah. And then when it's subtext, it's all emotion. Yeah. It's all it's all of these other things. And I think that that people when you actually talk to Americans, they're pretty nice mm -hmm. right they're they're pretty they're, they're they're not actually radicals they're not they're, they're like well some of my party is uh outliers are really fucking insane but i'm more scared of the other party and and that's yeah. really where i, I have think to hold my nose Americans. and vote every single time mm -hmm. yeah um and it would be nice to have a, a better country and you know this is also what was happening let's bring it back to the vortex for a second this is the sort of radicalization that yaya khan was using on his soldiers right he was mm -hmm. saying you're going to be in an area where you're going to be tasked to kill all these people. And I'm going to tell you why these people are the people you need to kill. You know, it, it helped that they didn't all speak the same language, Punjabi and yeah. Urdu versus um, Bengali. And, and once you have demonized somebody, once you say that other person is not actually human, uh, yeah. which we do all the time, yeah. you know, look at the way we talk about Russians right now. Look at the way we talk about Chinese sometimes like, you know, these people are not actually human and their lives are much less important than ours. Then it's easy to go totally off the rails. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get into a little bit. Um, the fact that when you have difficult times, we just gotten out of this pandemic if we are even out of it uh, and the recession that's following it and all that, you know, it's just kind of like one thing after another, it's been pretty difficult last few years and everything. People tend to, I think you sort of referenced this a second ago, they tend to go towards strong men. They mm -hmm. tend to go into authoritarianism. They, they tend to want somebody who will just say like, you know what, damn all the rules and everything. I'm going to fix the problem and go mm -hmm. in and take care of it. Um, I think we also become more culty. Mm hmm. And the fact that you were talking about cults a minute ago has got me wanting mm -hmm. to talk to you about that. Because one of the first, and maybe you know her, but one of the first um, guests that I had on this on this podcast was uh, Yanya Lalik, mm, a, a cult know. expert. Um, she's written lots of books on it. She's appeared on shows and stuff. But anyway, um, I've I've become. I mean, cults are fascinating, obviously, just mm -hmm. because salaciousness and everything. Um, I did a video. God, it's been about two years now. It was the the worst cults of all time, or the the five deadliest cults of all time, or whatever. It's oh yeah, the, I think I saw that one. It's the longest video I've ever made. It was fifty minutes long, mm -hmm. fifty three minutes long actually. Um, but of all the videos that I've done, there's there's a handful of them that just really did kind of change my thinking, and mm -hmm. make me see the world a little bit differently. And this was one of them, um, mm -hmm. because I said in the video that you know. Um, difficult times usually lead to a, a rise in cults. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm looking at the pandemic and everything that's going on and, and you know, the, the polarization and whatnot. And I was like, we, we, uh, a, a more fertile breeding ground for cults, you know, we have not seen in a long time. 
And I mm-hmm. asked her that. And the and when I interviewed her, I was like, was I right about that? Like, was I, you know, mm-hmm. assuming too much or whatever? And she was like, I have seen more cult activity in the last five years than I've seen in the previous 30 years. It has become like, I just kind of see it everywhere now. We've become so culty. Mm-hmm. And we, we just like lock into like, you know, particular heroes or people. And we decide that, that they've got all the answers and we're going to defend them to the teeth or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it seems like we're, we're trending in that direction a lot. And it's become something I've become really interested in and like trying to figure out where do we go from here and how do we, mm-hmm. how do we combat this? Yeah. I think that it's important to make some distinctions about the word cult sure. um, yeah. because the, you know, we're certainly becoming fragmented as a society and siloed in our information, right? We're, we're, we're everyone's niche now. Yeah. Um, and, and I, th- my understanding of a cult is you need to have a reified worldview. This is super important. You need to have one thing that explains everything about the world. And I, my specialty has been in Buddhist and spiritual cults, right? So yeah. in, in Buddhism, when you're going to get a, get a Buddhist cult, it's that the world is Maya, which means an illusion. And I can show you what true reality is. And this is also, you know, Christian cults, same thing. Everyone is damned. This is the pathway to heaven. This is the ultimate reality. And you don't know it. There's also, you know, the historical cults where, where, where you say history has formed you to think like this, but real reality is that it's a yeah, sort of matrix yeah. or, and you need, I feel like you have to have this as a prerequisite to really get culty behavior because um, it's what takes people out of reality. I, I'm probably expanding the definition of cult quite a bit when I use it in that way. But um, I guess it's more about just like falling into groupthink mm-hmm. and um, siloing your information to only fit what you, you know, want to believe. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I've made the argument that with, you know, we were talking about the positives of social media earlier. One of the negatives is we're kind of brainwashing ourselves. Totally. You know, just mm-hmm. on accident. But like, just mm-hmm. I'm only going to listen to what I want to hear because life is hard mm-hmm. and I just want to be comforted. Mm-hmm. And so we mm-hmm. just, uh, yeah. Yeah. We're stuck in these information silos and we don't. I, I, and I try to break out of it intellectually myself right but it's hard it's mm-hmm. really hard to see like even the algorithms won't like mm, no you're not going to look at the maga thing no i'm sorry we're not gonna, we're going to direct you to this other like you, it's it's it, it's we're so stuck in the way we think and 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 this is where we talk about the reification when I, where I mentioned earlier we are getting reified because we do believe the world is so siloed that like you know uh either masks destroyed America or they made America yeah, yeah. safer. I mean, I don't know, like, like that was so ridiculously divisive on like something that most people should have just shrugged at. Like, you know, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe in a different administration, people have been like, all right, this sucks, but we'll do it for a little bit. But then mm-hmm. it, it becomes the, they become these flashpoints that it's really difficult to see outside. And then we police it from the inside. Like, I don't know if mm-hmm. you've read the book Coddling of the American Mind, which is super great. And, and it, it looks at, um, liberal movements in universities. It's written by two liberals, but they're trying to like point out the group think among liberals, mm. which is, I think you have to critique your own group. Sure. Right? Yeah, totally. And, and it looks at how, um, universities, you know, you, you, the, the, it's like, you know, black lives matter that, that administrator is a racist. And then they, they like double and triple down, can't see any good action that administrator is trying to do and will escalate all the way to violence. Yeah. And if somebody, like if a professor says something that is, will get them minorly me too. I don't know what they did. They did something minor me too that yeah, yeah. 10 years ago we've been like, eh, all right, that sort of sucks, but like, you're not the worst person in the world. But then this person had this minor me too movement and then no one will defend them mm-hmm. on their in group because if they defend them, they, then they are the bad person too. Yeah. Or that yeah. person is like, Oh, that per- that economics professor is a little too liberal. Okay, well, so that or a little too conservative, and and therefore he's a fascist, right? And now no one's going to defend the fascist, and then then and then anyone who does, you kick them out of the group. And this is what's super scary mm-hmm. uh, in the left and the right is like you know we have the Rhino Republicans, right? The people are like maybe we're going a little too far, guys. What do you think? Uh, and and they're like they're kicked out, and it's it, and we also do this on the left, and I honestly I don't know how to get out of it because mm-hmm. I I don't. I don't think any group think is smart. Like, like, like if you're thinking like other people, it's because you're thinking emotionally. You're not looking at data, and it's it's both sides don't work on data, and I'm terrified. Mm-hmm. 
I find that when you're, you know, trying to cross the aisle and talk to somebody who uh, might not politically be on the same side as you, if you if you keep it to policy and not politics mm -hmm. and, and keep identity and personalities out of it and everything, but mm -hmm. just focus on like, you know, what is is this move a good or a bad move? You know, mm -hmm. um, you find that people actually align with you a lot more than they think they do. Like they, they, sure. they tend to like fall into personality patterns and, and, you know, follow certain specific individuals because of politics or whatever group think. Mm -hmm. But, but when it comes down to it, when you say like, you know, should we have X, Y, Z tax rate? Uh, should mm -hmm. we do this? Should we do that? It's like, well, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's like, okay, well, mm -hmm. but this guy you're voting yeah. against is the one that wants to do that. So, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah, should, should we keep tons of black people in prison, right? Like yeah. way more black people. There's, there's whole, like, there's a whole Republican prison reform lobby that's mm -hmm. out there. And, and, you know, I don't necessarily like everything they say, but like, no, they're actually trying to work on the issue and they have some ideas that are not bad. Right. Sure. And, yeah. and, and there, there is absolutely common ground out there. And I think you're right. It's when you talk about policy, like this is the problem. But mm -hmm. if instead you say, Lauren Boebert thinks we should do this yeah. or something like that, yeah. it's like, it's like, you know, everyone just loses their freaking mind. Yeah. It's like take identity out of it as much as possible and just make mm -hmm. it about the mm -hmm. specific things. Yeah. If um, we can, but that the other problem with social media is everything's about identity, right? Yeah. Every everyone's a, a star. I mean, I know I'm talking to a legitimate YouTube star here, so you know, <laughs> not but, me, but everybody else. <laughs> but everyone is like everyone thinks that they're everyone needs a hot take. Everyone needs yeah. to know. Yeah. You can't like when was the last time you admitted you were wrong on on a YouTube channel, and then like and then like you suddenly saw like you got a thousand comments being like, I can't believe you were wrong. You wrong. And it's like, dude, I'm, I'm wrong all the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is just when I admitted it. Mm. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. There was, um, somebody I would love to have on this uh, podcast is, uh, uh, another science communicator named Sabine Hassenfelder. She, um, she's an actual physicist. And she did a video about the double slit experiment or, or one of those or, or the delayed choice mm. quantum experiment anyway. Um, and she kind of referenced my video because I got some things wrong or mm. I had made some wrong assumptions or whatever. And I got all of these tweets sitting. I was like, oh, Sabine called you out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, then listen to her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to me. She's an actual mm. physicist. You know? mm. <laughs> like, I don't have a an, an ego about that, you know. Um, but I've become really interested in um, the attention economy lately. Like I've been reading a lot about it and getting some books that I'll take a year to read. But um, it's again, it's more of I'm more of a systems thing. Um, when people are incentivized to be um, controversial, they're going to be more controversial. Mm -hmm. If they're incentivized to pile on in some kind of like. My argument would be that, yes, cancel culture is kind of a thing, but it's really more just everybody trying to use the systems and mm -hmm. networks that are in place to build their own right. fake Internet points. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's really just about the attention economy and like mm -hmm. the, the most valuable thing is attention. And everybody knows that, like, you know, every, everybody that's five years old knows that the best way to get attention is to you know, mm -hmm. take a marker and draw it on the wall or go punch another kid or something, you know? And, and so mm -hmm. when you incentivize that kind of behavior, you're going to see a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's become a thing I've, I'm, I've really become interested in. Cause I, 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 I really think the most valuable commodity in the world today is attention, the way things are set up and people. Yeah. yeah they tried to make it, they, they, I think, you know, Facebook, is, the, is the, the progenitor of this, right? They they realized that they didn't have a business model, but they <laughs> but eventually they could sell stuff if they just took all of your time and your commercial mm -hmm. activity migrated to them. I mean, you know, other people are involved with this as well. Um, yeah, it is terrifying that that and, and also I mean I think you did a video on this too. On, you did something about shorts uh, where oh, yeah, everyone's yeah. trying everyone's trying to become TikTok, right? Uh -huh. it's, it's like not only do we have uh, they want all of your attention. They, they, they realize you don't have an attention span anymore. And now, <laughs> and now you have to like do shorter and shorter videos mm -hmm. and the creators who like the reason why I went, came over to YouTube is because I wanted to be able to talk for a while. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and your videos do this too. You talk for a while. I have this, this issue requires nuance sure. and I have to raise at least three points. 
Now it's like, can you get your headline exactly right with the big text on top of it that says war is good or whatever it is mm-hmm. you're going to put on <laughs> put there. And and if you don't nail it exactly, you are not rewarded with your Internet points, but also yeah. in, in, in cases, livelihoods uh, as well, because we all think that we can be um, superstars at some mm-hmm. point. Like there's this dream that I can become. People would love me if I if I if they will, I would get the likes if they just you know if I just get the right combination and I also think there's a, sort of a gambling addiction involved with this. Mm. It's not only the attention economy, which is, which is totally you're right, but also this sense is that we we hear about the 14 year old who did a funny dance on TikTok or whatever, and it was it seemed like a low effort thing, and then they got a million followers, and 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 now they're they're famous, and we we say that over and over again. It's the same dopamine hit as mm-hmm. gambling because there's a lot mm-hmm. of dumb 13 year olds doing dumb dances it's not everyone who gets it but it's the same thing as buying a lottery ticket and we're just ding ding we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're pulling that lever over and over again and i it's that that's also terrifying and we are you know internet addicted there are neuroscientists involved in this and and yet we also perpetrate that narrative over and over again yeah yeah um it's funny that like uh, I hear that I guess kids growing up now like they all want to be YouTube stars or they all want to mm-hmm. be YouTubers like that's the the number one thing that the kids want to be now uh, because I grew up wanting to be a filmmaker I wanted to make like movies and win <laughs> Oscars and all that you know and and so like I landed on YouTube so I still feel like a failure you know I still mm-hmm. feel like I missed the mark you know and and the the idea that there's younger people that are like looking up to me or wanting to do what I do. Uh, I'm just kind of like, why? Because I, I, I messed up. <laughs> you know? I got it you wrong, I man. Don't, I don't think you did. I think you were actually um, very prescient in the way that your career worked. And lucky. You were very lucky. I've been very lucky, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, but the thing that happened, so I started off on the, the you know, New York Times bestselling book list, right? Like doing, doing, trying Pretty to do- Pretty good place to be. Yeah, no, it's good. But I wanted to be the serious investigative journalist who eventually wrote for the New Yorker, right? Like that yeah. was that was like very similar um, ambitions as you yeah. uh, to begin with. But one thing that we've seen in the sort of the destruction of, of media empires is that those prestige things are no longer effective at, yeah. at, at doing anything because now the New Yorker is also competing with the same thumbnail as everyone else on, mm-hmm. I, I don't think they're not on Twitter anymore. I don't know, but you know, on wherever it is. And it's the individual reporters who have social media followings that now are wagging the dog for better and worse. And you yeah. see the destruction of media where it used to be like there were laws saying that you had to release news content in certain ways that was centralized. And then there was editors being like, oh, well, I had pushed back early in my career all the time being like, well, can we say this because it's not fair and like blah, blah, blah. And there was like a discussion that would go on before you would put it out to your big community because mm-hmm. you had a responsibility or a news person. That is dead. Yeah. Fact checking is basically dead in terms of like the formal system that used to exist. And, and now I'm seeing the value of social media in a way that I didn't before. Like I know when my first couple of books that someone would be like, a podcaster wants to talk to me. I'm only talking to Steve Inskeep at NPR. (laughs) And now it's like, please put me on Rogan. Rogan, please, my friend. I am good. But that's the attention economy. (laughs) Because you can get more attention on places like that. Yes. Um, and but your Oscar dreams are, you know, we, we're looking at the Oscars fall apart, right? Will Smith punches. I know, somebody, and yeah. That's the story. It's not it's, the Oscars. It's won. actually really funny because like it, it used to be. I mean, I used to go to Academy sponsored events. I mean, I'm in Dallas, so it's not like a big deal or anything. But but like they would host events here where you would go to the movie theater and they would you know show the Oscars and we'd get all dressed up and everything. It was like mm-hmm. a whole thing. Um, I mean, it was. It, it was it was an event for me. It was it was something I paid a lot of attention to. I have barely watched the last few Oscars and, and or, or cared at all about what won. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think you're right. I think it's legitimacy or it's importance has has slipped quite a bit. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the rise of social media and whatnot, but like um, the media landscape in general is just it's still the Wild West. We're still trying to figure it all out. Yeah, I mean, it's pushing to streaming services, which are now are fragmenting, and we're going to see yeah. the streaming services go into like all sorts of different directions. Um, and 
it, yeah, it's going to be ultimately personality driven. It's going to be the person with the most ability to get engagement and also the, the social media platform that participates with them. Cause like, I, I really loved your shorts video because it just showed me how, you know, one little tweak in the algorithm and you, 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 you destroy giants. Like you can just mm -hmm. like, you know, it, it could just, it just we're, we're only interested in shorts now. So I don't care about your long video. And it's funny. I started my YouTube channel on the same week that your numbers started like arbitrarily dropping. <laughs> well, thanks. You took all my views. <laughs> you bastard. Um, and uh, well, I don't really do that. Um, but like it, it, we're not we're not talking with nuance. We're being you know, they're trying to sap our attention mm -hmm. and they don't want really meaningful attention. Right. They don't really want you to to think deeply and meditate and sleep on something and like they want you just to go to the like i'm so driven i'm so like like i'm in fight or flight and i'll flip this again yeah. i'm in fight or flight and i'll flip this again i'm in fight or flight yeah. um oh which re totally reminds me of another I'll do a segue for a second here so i wrote this book the wedge where i was talking about the neurology of of internet addiction and oh, okay. this was weird right where where the the that your brain is the fight or flight system and the rest and digest system, you only have two systems that your body is sort of works on um, and it's innervated by the vagus nerve. Um, the focal length of your, uh, of your lens in your eye, which focuses something far to near, will, if it's close, if it's focused on a close thing, it automatically triggers your fight or flight responses more than something that is distant if you're hmm. looking at it. So, and this, you know, think about the lion in the savannah. Sure, yeah. Lion's way over there. And it's way less scary when it's like half a mile away. But when the lion's right here, your your the lens in your eye moves, and it's like, oh, that's a very scary lion. And it's hmm. just it's just a it, it's a habituated thing. But now when we have in the era of screens, I have my cell phone, and I'm reading about the most recent thing that you know makes everyone angry. And because your eye is focused at a short length, you're automatically your nervous system is primed to be more in fight or flight. Hmm. Which is crazy. Okay, so I find that interesting because um people have always used their hands and made things and, and mm -hmm. like, you know, chipped away on rocks or mm -hmm. you know, whittled or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and and that's up close. So but it also has to do with focus, right? So in terms of um, if your uh, attention is, if you're making a tool is a great thing. So I'm napping a, yeah. a, a new shirt blade. Out sure. of, you know, yeah. I found some shirt blades and your focus attention is actually also related to fight or flight. Because if you're in a fight, you know, and they, there's, you, you can play with this in a lot of ways, but if you're fighting somebody, you don't know what's going on three feet away from you. Sure. You have no idea. You're just focusing on a right right here and that is like the the supercharged uh, sympathetic nervous system that's 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 being activated there mm -hmm. and so if you're doing a chert you're probably not aware at all what's going on right here mm -hmm. you know it would have to be a very loud stimulus or a very strong stimulus to make you go mm, oh lion and then that's going to be a bigger <laughs> bigger problem yeah now you're focused on that mm -hmm. i'm trying you to forget about your chert blade <laughs> <laughs> oh i got a blade right here <laughs> um well dude we've been talking for a while um, no. and I have plenty more stuff to record and I don't want to take up too much of your day, but, um, no you said something about you had a book coming out soon. Oh my God. Being re-released or. Yeah. Uh, I have a book uh, about napping that I'm working on right now, but I also have a book called the enlightenment trap about the, um, uh, about obsession, madness yeah. and death on diamond mountain where, where, where somebody died while meditating. And it's a deep dive into the insanity of intensive meditation and the, the strange conversation we have between Eastern religions and Western um, sort of consumption of those religions and, and how medieval debates in India and Tibet that have no bearing, that you would think have no bearing on our life right now are intrinsically affecting everything that we do here uh, with, you know, when we do yoga, when we say mm, namaste, or when we, when we do all of this stuff and, and how the physical practices associated with Buddhism um, are, and when they get mixed with, with like underlying Christianity that we, mm -hmm. we have and just create this weird hybrid. It's a, it's a really fun book and I, I'm re-releasing it. I released it in 2015 under a different, um, different title and some different stuff, but I've added mm -hmm. photographs and new chapters and this book is badass. Ooh, cool. and 
I, I, we get to talk a little bit about the the penis cult of Bhutan, in Bhutan, which is fun. Hey, you had me at penis cult. It's... <laughs> so everybody go check out the penis cult book. And uh... <laughs> was that the original title, the the penis cult book? No, but I think that that's your catchy. Uh, uh, this you should just do another video on this. Google, that's our title Google for this podcast. The the penis cult. Yeah, yeah. Scott <laughs> We're gonna talk Carney about it for thirty and... seconds, but that's gonna be the title. Scott Carney and the Great Penis Cult of Bhutan. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. You gotta gotta get those clicks. So you got your YouTube channel. I want to point some people toward that. Um, yes. What should the, they search the for Scott, to find that? The Joe Scott Bump. Um, oh, I, hopefully. I, I, it's uh s i'm not sure what it is just put it in the in the put it down there in the thing scott um, carney. i think it i think it's probably scott carney on youtube mm -hmm. uh or it, yeah you'll find it you'll find it uh you, you just just search me out i'm ashamed to say i didn't even know it existed until i was kind of getting ready to to meet mm -hmm. with you on this and i i i think you maybe said something in an email about it and i was like what and i looked and it's like oh my god he's got a freaking youtube channel this is awesome and they're good stuff too well, I'm following your lead here. I'm like, well, Joe Scott did it and he's smart and some people think I'm smart. So maybe I can do something smart because I don't want to just do TikToks. I'm tired of dancing. My <laughs> flossing is un is not very good. Your twerking <laughs> is not getting any better. And uh... Uh, no, I, I've been listening to your channel for ages and uh, and I like the fact that you're able to, um, you know, it, it deploy nuance into the world like that's super impressive and important and and there need to be um there need to be more people like you we, we need soldiers on the front line of nuance mm. and uh, and you're one of them and uh, and i really appreciate the the work that you do because of that because it it it, it influences you, you've led me down so many wells of curiosity yeah. where i'm like that's so cool and i'm naturally add and i think you're probably i'm gonna i'm gonna just throw this on you you're probably add too maybe a little maybe yeah uh and and i feel like i have so many ideas for books on like so many disparate subjects it's nice to like come across one of your videos like god thank god i don't have to write that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, every once in a while, I'll, I'll find a topic that I'm like, oh my God, I want to talk about this, but I'll find another video on it that's just perfect. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't top that. I, I, I'm just going to share that on tw on Twitter or something. Like, as interested as I am in it, that guy did it perfectly, and I, just, I don't know what I could add to that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, unless I'm just desperate for clicks, and I think it's a click-worthy kind of thing. But um, I think you and I are similar <laughs> in, the, in the sense that, like, I, 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 I am interested in a lot of different things. It's hard to pin down exactly what I want to do, which is probably a good thing that I post weekly. So it's like, don't don't spend mm -hmm. too much time on it. I don't have time to get really in depth on any of these things. Just kind of like right. cover the basics, get a surface level view, tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, actually, when you talk about it being me being nuanced and stuff, um, I appreciate you saying that. And you're not other people have said the same thing. Um, it's not that I'm trying to be to me. It's just storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like, hey, look at this crazy thing over here. But, you know, there's this downside over here, you know, the, mm -hmm. the little roller coaster of up and down. And that's just that's just storytelling to me. So it's like if I were to just be like, sis, boom, ba, yay, fusion reaction or mm -hmm. something um, without telling the fact that like, oh, it's actually it's not that big a deal. And we're not really that much closer or whatever. Like it's mm -hmm. um, it, that's not as interesting to me. To me, it's a lot more interesting mm -hmm. to kind of like cover all the all the different angles and, and pin them against each other and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, well, it, it also is more fun to have nuance and to think about things a little bit more complexly because if they're, if we lived in a world that all had all the answers then what the hell are we doing? Right. And, and, and this is actually also one of the things that I write about in the enlightenment trap is like, and, and a lot of the works that even my wife's book about Sasquatch is sort yeah. of weirdly touches on this is that when you have the answers and you know that you're right, then you've arrived. And so what's the point? Yeah. Life's boring after that. But anyway, you need to go. You have stuff to do. <laughs> You're a busy guy. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just, uh, just thank you so much for having me on. This has been a blast. Oh, I love the book. And, and thank you. for the record, anybody listening, go read it. It's great. And I'm going to have to check out some of your others, actually. I know. Have me on anytime you want to talk about cults, organ trafficking, ice baths. Or, you know, <laughs> See, or you war. cover so many Come different on, things. On. We're going to have to have you on several times. <laughs> All, All right, right, Scott, this Thanks has been so, great. Thanks so much, Joe. We'll have to do it again sometime.
So big thanks to Scott for joining me. That was a lot of fun. Um, he and I had been kind of emailing for a while, so it was a great to actually sit down and talk with him. Do go check out his book, Vortex. Um, it's on Amazon and other, all the other places where you can find books. I'm telling you, I read it. It blew my mind. I, I don't know how we over here in the U.S. never heard about this whole story, but it's, it's crazy. Um, and uh, I enjoyed it. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, I just want to thank Scott again for being here. Now, before you go, I'm, uh, you know, kind of getting into a merch thing on my channel recently. I've got some, some really cool merch to sell. It's all brand new. I've never really pushed it before, but it's kind of, it's kind of time to start getting it out there. So you always see me in these nerdy t-shirts on the show and whatnot. Well, you might not know those, these are all for sale. That's what they are. These are my shirts and, and you can get them at answerswithjoe.com slash store. There's branded shirts with my logo on them. Also posters, mugs, stickers, lots of different fun and nerdy things that you can, uh, have, you know, put up and it has nothing to do with my logo, but it's it's just fun stuff that might make a good gift for someone uh, or just might put something on you that other people will see and, and they'll get the joke and then you'll know that there are good people and you make friends that way. That's how it works. So anyway, if you haven't been there, uh, lots of cool stuff to go look at. So please go check it out. Answers to Joe.com slash store. It helps support the channel and it's just cool, fun stuff. So there you go. This episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me at Answers with Joe pretty much everywhere on the socials. Of course, my YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Please do share this. And if you thought it was interesting, a nice review on whatever podcast player you're listening to right now really does go a long way. But until next time, thanks. Have a good one. Now go out there and start some conversations of your own. Take care. <laughs>